Peggy may or may not remember this, but back in 2010, Peggy went with me and Bill Gerstenmeier and we'll be a small team of people uh, over to China. And we visited Beijing, Shanghai, and I always forget way out in the Gobi Desert, their, their launch site for, human, for their human spaceflight program. And, um, you know, I, I just remember we, we had an opportunity. They had just selected their first two female astronauts, whatever they wanted to call them. And, and I remember them coming out and, and meeting Peggy, and it was like God. Uh, it's like they were meeting God. You know, <laughs> even in China, they knew who Peggy Whitson was, you know, the, the first woman to be chief of the astronaut office, this, this astronaut extraordinaire. And I, I remember just beaming uh, watching this because this is exactly what, what I think what you're talking about, Rex, the fact that, that we all appreciate each other for the talent and skills that we bring to this thing. And, and we don't look at, um, you know, we don't look at what country somebody came from or what race they are or what religion they are. We just get focused on the mission and, and we pick people that we want to be like. And those two young Chinese women wanted to be like Peggy Whitson. And I was, just, I was sitting there just beaming it. But Peggy, she, she just chilled, you know, it's no big deal. <laughs> two more, two more, uh, two more disciples here. <laughs> That's not what I think, Charlie. You know that. <laughs> so I'm sure at some point over a career like that, there's there goes there comes a point where you go from being a person to receiving that sort of the hero worship or the the adulation that astronauts as a an entity have always gotten. Apparently, even from other astronauts. So I'm curious about y'all as people. Is when that started to become your experience, did it feel weird? How do you adjust? I mean, I'm sure you still feel like the same person inside. So how much of it for you is a job and how much of it is adapting into becoming a different sort of figure? For me, it, it was very unbelievable to try and think of myself as a big role model or anything like that. I just it, it's hard to swallow. Uh, but once you accept that, I think it it improves your ability to communicate some of what you want people to take away from your experience and uh, allows you to give a better message maybe i don't know i for me it, it was definitely a big hurdle to get over being that whole idea that yes i should be a role model yeah it's interesting bo how you frame the question because you know it is very definitely part of your job and i think the sooner you kind of accept that responsibility and kind of get over yourself <laughs> you know, the better you become at it. it becomes a responsibility to try to communicate effectively and be responsive. And, you know, I think all of us have different personalities uh, with respect to how much we like or dislike the spotlight. But if the spotlight's on you, you know, it's time to perform and you need to do the best you can to get, you know, the right message across. So I think we're all, for me, it's an evolution and I'm still not used to it or comfortable with it. I mean, it, it's certainly different than the day that I started being an astronaut, but I, I'm, I'm not, it's not natural quite yet. And I think it's probably true of a lot of us. Charlie, you were administrator, right? So, I mean, you, yeah. I don't know how the astronaut thing, you know, was part of that and how much they tried to downplay that or upplay that. I, um, I always get back to the imposter syndrome. I, um, every place I've been or every level I've been, even from being a general in the Marine Corps all the way up to being the NASA administrator, I'm always pinching myself, um, you know, saying, why am I here? You, you know, how the hell did I get here? And it's like you said, LA, at some point, you know, you, you realize that, okay, there's something that needs to be done here and I'm here for a purpose. And, and I wanna help other people understand that, that I am an ordinary person, just like I think I am, but I've been given an extraordinary opportunity. And um, I think that's where all four of us are. We, we, lived extra we lived ordinary lives until we were given this opportunity to do this extraordinary thing. And, and, and then it becomes incumbent upon us to try to relate that to other people, particularly young kids, and help them understand that they too can do the same thing. So um, I, I was always pinching myself as the NASA administrator, but, but I just went ahead and tried to do what, what was required to be done. You know, it's it's an interesting kind of fame, though, for for most of us. I know Peggy and and Charlie, they, people probably recognize you. I mean, me in L.A., you know, we can go anywhere with, if we're not wearing a flight suit, and people wouldn't know who we are, which is great because you can have a certain certain sort of anonymity. 
And then it's, it's surprising sometimes you put the flight suit on and you're getting all this attention and it's a little bit overwhelming. Um, and I got some good advice a while back that that uh, somebody said, you know, the, the life on the road when you're doing the public affairs and public relations, when you're wearing the suit, that's not real life. And if you start treating yourself like that's the way you deserve to be treated, uh, it has some very bad effects. Mm-hmm. And so you just have to remind yourself when you're out there and people are, you know, uh, you're making a fuss over you that hey, that's not the that's not the real world. And when you get back home, you got to be the same person. And when you're interacting with people, you got to be the same person. So it's a, fortunately that we don't have to, you know, like the Hollywood movie star who can't go anywhere. I, I don't know how they would deal with something like that. So this is kind of something that goes on and off at a, at a reasonable rate, which is which makes it a little more easy to handle. The story that made the most impact on me in my in this astronaut life was, um, you know, was getting to know Neil Armstrong uh, for a while before he passed. And 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 he's an incredibly humble guy, um, very quiet, um, very confident, but 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 very quiet. And I remember talking about he, he was talking about how much he enjoyed having gone back to the University of Cincinnati and gotten back in the classroom. And he said what he enjoyed the most was standing in front of a lecture hall, you know, standing in front of a bunch of students and looking at 200 faces and realizing that not a single kid of the 200 kids knew him as anything other than Professor Armstrong. They had no clue. Going back to what you said, Rex, they had no clue. He said that that was perfect for me because I could then focus on teaching my class and trying to influence these kids. And and I, I just found that absolutely flabbergasted. Yeah, I got to meet him once too at the Kennedy Space Center. I was just about to give a, you know, one of those launch guest tours where they take a bunch of people on, on the bus and tour them around the Kennedy Space Center. Before I get on the bus, one of the public affairs person says, hey, I just want to let you know that Neil Armstrong is going to be on this bus. And I'm going, you got to be kidding me. What, what is, I'm supposed to give a tour to Neil Armstrong? He goes, you know, he's bringing in some of his family, his, probably his grandkids and stuff. He goes, but you can't let anybody know that he's on the bus or they'll mob him and it will, it'll ruin it for him. And so, of course, I was wearing my blue flight suit, so everybody knew I was an astronaut. And uh, I tried to make a fuss about it. He came up and was, just like you said, Charlie, he was the most genuine, nice person you'd ever want to meet. And uh, so the tour went great. And there was one point, though, where a lady was going to take a picture of me since I was in my flight suit. And she waited because somebody was in the way. And the person in the way was Neil Armstrong. And so she waits till he gets out of the way to take a picture. And, and I just was, I could tell you, lady, you don't want a picture of me. You want a picture of me. I didn't say anything, but it was really funny. But he's, like I say, just a really humble guy. That's funny. <laughs> I had uh an interesting experience with him you know he came to i want to say it was alan shepherd died you know in the mid to late 90s and they had a, a reception or some sort of an event for him in building nine um and this is at johnson space center and you know their it was the astronaut office was invited and their spouses or whatever and it was kind of you know there's a lot of mock-ups around and so they had these corridors where you could walk and everything is sort of roped off so it was kind of tight quarters in some spaces so um i was there with my, my wife at the time and she stepped back from a conversation and inadvertently stepped on neil armstrong's foot <laughs> and i said you know you just have a 50 50 chance of having stepped on the first foot that stepped on the <laughs> That's that's amazing. It it makes me wonder, you know, for y'all, I wonder if meeting Neil Armstrong, given that he sort of was the paragon of the profession you were in, it feels to me like it would be for me to meet Carl Sagan or something like that. Was it like that for y'all, or is it more? Does the astronaut family sort of transcend time in that way that it was it was more respect than awe or? I'm just wondering. It seems so fascinating. For me, it was it was it was a little bit of awe, and uh, it just it, like the kind of imposter syndrome that uh, that Charlie talked about. You, you think this can't be real? I can't be considered as part of this line of people who've flown in space. And the same thing happened when when John Glenn got his flight his, on a shuttle flight. Um, Peggy, I don't know if you remember, we were down at the Kennedy Space Center as astronaut candidates. And uh, he came and and was on the same stage as we had a, a function that night and. He was the member of, you know, the uh, the first class of astronauts, and we were a member of the, uh, you know, the, the sardines, the 16th class. And uh, I, I remember sitting on that stage thinking, I can't believe 
I'm part of this lineage of astronauts from the first to the brand new. It was just it was just kind of one of those pinch me moments. Yeah, you know, and I you know I definitely know that uh, Neil was my inspiration for wanting to become an astronaut because I remember wa watching on TV when he stepped on the moon, and I think it was a, a very inspirational time in my life. You know, I I actually enjoy talking to young people that are about eight to 12, because to me, that's that time frame when they're most receptive to ideas and influences. And that was when I saw Neo walk on the moon and I was like, looks like a cool job to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> people that are, um, that are examples that you want to follow. Uh, you know, we all pick, um, we all pick role models or people that we would like to be like. And I, I can remember my first year in the astronaut office. In fact, we we got there in July of 1980, and uh, we were introduced to uh, Alan Bean was, you know, one of the moonwalkers, and he was our dende. And so, for one whole year during our astronaut candidacy, the guy that rode the buses with us, and you know, and 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 sat in the back of things with us, and everything was was a moonwalker was Alan Bean, and this guy was again so humble. Um, talked about anything you wanted to talk, talk about, answered any questions you wanted to answer, but he was there to help get you through this first, uh, for, for many of us, difficult hurdle of getting out of being an astronaut candidate to being recognized as somebody who's finished the training and is now ready to be assigned to space flight. And, and, and it never ended with him. I remember talking to him um, just, just prior to his death, and he, he was a phenomenal artist, if you did not see him. So uh, his, his, his artwork is just unbelievable. But I call because we were trying to get him to come to the Naval Academy to participate in something that LA and I have done a number of times called the Astronaut Convocation, where we bring some Naval Academy graduates back to talk to the midshipmen about the space program. And we were looking for a moonwalker because we wanted to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Apollo. And, and we couldn't find one that wanted to come. So I called Al Bean and he said, you know, I am honored, particularly as a University of Texas alum, uh, we, you know, we, I would love to come back there to do that. He said, but you know, I don't have much time left and I've got too much work to do. He won, he had a couple of more lunar landscapes that he wanted to paint. And he recognized the fact that that's what his life was now dedicated to. So, you know, again, he gave me this example of, you may have loved flying in space, but there's now something else that you really need to focus on. That's going to give a message to people here on earth and help help bring other people along. And that, for him, it was the choice of art.